Okay, friends. It's Rob here. It's another Robcast. And this one, there is a movie on Netflix called True Cost. You, If you get that Netflix, do you have the interweb? Get that Netflix and see this movie, True Cost. It is about the clothing industry. And it's, I'm telling you, I don't even know what to say about it, other than the director, narrator, creator of the film is here in the back house with me now, Andrew Morgan. Andrew, welcome. <laughs> Great to be here. <laughs> this is his first time on the Robcast, obviously. <laughs> and this film, it made me so angry. Did you have that response to the film? Mm, yeah. It, it I, I teared up multiple times. It produced such anger and frustration and rage. Um, Andrew has made this film. Well, I don't even know. How about this? Where did you first get the idea f- for True Cost? Yeah, I was um, I was finishing up another film and I was getting coffee one morning. Um, actually, very close to your house here, and um, I was standing in line, half asleep. Looked down at the cover of the New York Times, and there was a photograph that morning, and it was this photograph of these two boys. Uh, similar in age to my own boys at home, and they were standing in front of this huge wall of missing person signs. And it was one of those photos just grabs you, yeah. and I, I picked up the the paper, and I read this headline about how a clothing factory had collapsed in Bangladesh, just outside of Dhaka. And uh, it had taken the lives of uh, more than a 1,000 people, mostly women, some children. And I went on to read about how at the time of the collapse, it was making clothes for, you know, these major Western brands, brands that I knew, uh, brands that I had, you know, frequented. And I remember thinking two unforgettable things as I stood there that morning, uh, instantly very awake. I remember thinking, uh, first, you know, how is it possible that an industry this powerful, this profitable is doing business in a way that's leading to this kind of loss and, as I read in the article, lessening of human life? Um, and then second, on a more personal and chilling level, I remember thinking, uh, how is it possible that I've never stopped to think about where my clothes actually come from? And it was that question that led me to take the article back to my office, share it with my producer. We started to kind of research, read everything we could get our hands on, follow that, that story. It was on the news cycle for uh, a, a couple days. And by the end of that week, I was just convinced that this was um, just a profoundly important human uh, story that touches every single one of us that I had never seen, and that it was producing so many questions that I couldn't answer. And uh, that that's really, I mean, by the end of that week, we, we knew we were making the film. It feel, There are moments in the film, that makes sense to me now, when it feels like you're hunting, you're trying to answer questions. So you sort of follow where do clothes get made, and it takes you all over the world. Well, that was the kind of surprising thing is I think uh, we, we started and, you know, at that time it was all about Bangladesh. This, this factory had collapsed in Bangladesh um, not long before that there had been another major fire in a factory in Bangladesh. Um, before that, there had been one in Pakistan. So it was, it was this very condensed area of the world. And I think as we did more research, as we started to talk to more people, it kind of um, it unraveled, really. I mean, it was that sense of layers kept coming off and... And as we went into production, I mean, the film ended up taking us to 13 countries, uh, several of those countries multiple times. And it, the film kind of became that, that mosaic that you sort of see of ideas and countries and people and that idea that these are all related, yet yes. all very separate. That was, that was completely my experience of making the film. That was like my every step we took led to that next step. Everything we uncovered was like, oh, well, then we have to go look at these other things. Yeah. Um, and that, that I didn't see coming at all. It has a scandalous nature to it, where you would, in the film, you would uncover a truth about where clothes come from, but that would lead to another layer, to another layer. How about, can you start with defining fast fashion and sort of the money at stake and what that has come to mean? Yeah. To give an idea. I mean, obviously, that's in the film, and people will go see yeah. the film. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's what's always interesting. I think at any time in history, you always think whatever you're doing right now has been normal forever. And the way we consume clothing has changed uh, dramatically and, and almost overnight. Um, and from a quantity perspective, it helps to point out that in the last two decades alone, uh, we now consume as a world more than 400% more clothes. So um, 
more than 80 billion new garments. You're using a year. the verb consume and not wear. Well, there, that's and, interestingly and, enough. You and know what I mean? Yeah, and there, and that's a really that's a really good point because that kind of consumption coming into our closet, um, we 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 don't have uh, infinitely bigger closets or how you know we're we're getting rid of it very quickly too. And what what traditionally historically was a commodity that we invested in, that we bought and cherished and wore and repaired and passed on and sure. held on to, has become something. The term fast fashion denotes that quality of disposal of. Um, it's, it's become something that comes into my life very quickly and, and goes out of my life very quickly. And what that's done is in, in concert with, you know, a real globalized uh, sense of production, outsourcing a lot of the production. In 1960s, we were still making 97% of our clothes in the U.S. Fast forward to— Whoa, whoa, in the 60s. In the 60s. It's serious, 1960s. Fast forward to now, it's, it's now less than 2%. In the 1960s, the average— American was where ninety seven percent of the things that Americans were wearing were made here. Right here. And now it's two percent. Yeah, under under two percent. So so what we've done is we've we've moved a lot of the production offshores overseas and a lot of people are familiar with you know the concept of globalization. That has brought with it incredible uh, price drops on clothing. So so clothing is one of the only deflationary items in the global market. That's Oh. It has gotten cheaper over time. So, so if you think about that, and this is what I did, you you sort of you look at that and you say, okay, um, raw raw materials haven't gotten cheaper, um, transportation hasn't gotten cheaper by and large, and you very quickly begin to look at this incredible multi-billion-dollar industry as something fueled by there is one part of that equation that has gotten dramatically cheaper, and that's human labor. <sighs> And that's where it ushers in this set of questions about human rights and then begins to look at the, the aspect of, of waste and environmental impact at the same time. So you take us to Bangladesh. There's these, these rivers that are polluted. You take us to what leather, the stacks of leather with the kids playing. Um, what? Now, now, there's one scene where there's conflict between the police and workers who are simply arguing for more money so they can have a decent mm-hmm. – and it would something like add like 13% to the cost of clothes. There's like a shooting scene. Were you there? Uh, yeah, we were during the stuff in Cambodia. Some of the footage was gathered from third yeah. parties, and then we were there during a lot of what you see in the film, yeah. Were you running? Were the bullets? You were. We were not. We were not running with bullets. Um, the stuff where the police opened fire. The police. There was a confrontation between garment workers in Nam Pen, Cambodia, where yeah. the garment workers basically uh, went on strike to demand um, a, a living wage, and um, it's 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 laughably and tragically small what they were asking for. Um, mm-hmm. It's it's human at a very very basic basic level of what human means and um i was trying to keep up with the math and it was like 30 dollars for a month they were asking it's or 60 it, yeah for it's, the month. it's un- yeah it's unbelievable and it's 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 one of those things that um six dollars a day that's what it was when i when the math in the movie was something like they were asking could we have six dollars a day for our efforts yeah and they weren't getting it. Yeah, and there was unbelievable, you know, police brutality and unbelievable crackdowns and unbelievable, um, yeah, and, and and police open firing live rounds in the streets. All all stories that are reflected multiple times over that are uh, continually not making our news cycles. Um, all stories that are happening right now around the world uh, as it relates to to global supply chains, uh, especially fashion, that um, that just stay beneath the radar. And I think that's, that was the really incredible thing for me is, um, you know, in every one of these countries, uh, it's, it's easy to look at these things as topics, as issues, you know, as, uh, you know, you look at this industry, it's the most labor dependent industry in the world. It employs the poorest of the working poor. It's over two thirds fueled by women. It's, and you can know all those things in your mind. And then when you go and you spend time in these places with these people, you realize this is, um, this is this is actually their their life. This is their only experience of being a human on this planet. And this is they they've been born into a different part of the system than I was born into. And because of that, their life has been lessened at at an extent, not just through resources but opportunity, and now seized upon for systemic exploitation uh, in a way that's. Um, yeah, it's it's really it's really horrifying. And it's it's inhumane and it's and it's and it's tragic in its invisibility, you yes. know? That that's the part that's yes. unsettling. That's 
Yeah, which is why I began with this movie made me so angry, which probably isn't the nicest way to open an interview with the director. <laughs> but I, in some senses, if you if you aren't furious in this movie, then you're not watching the movie. Mm. Um, how, like, there's this recurring street shot of an American city with an H and M logo and a Gap logo, and at one point, um, you say we approached mm -hmm. the major U.S. clothing retailers. And none of them would speak to us. Did did that make you great? I mean, that must have been so frustrating. Yeah, it was frustrating because, like, you know, as I said, I, I didn't come into this, you know, with some long career in fashion. I, I didn't have this, this big axe to grind. I, I don't I haven't been this big activist. I don't. Um, I'm just a person who buys clothes and, uh, I'm a human being, I'm a father, I'm a filmmaker. And I was uh, driven by a sense of curiosity and I wanted to tell the story and I, I wanted to tell a story in the most honest mm -hmm. way that I possibly could. And I fully expected to have those interviews. And, um, and sometimes we got very far. Sometimes it was multiple conversations and there was all sorts of concessions we were making, um, to make it as low risk as possible for them. It's like, I wasn't going to do an, a gotcha interview. I wasn't going to. I just wanted to, I wanted to hear um, their side of the story, and um, yeah, they just they just across the board fundamentally said no, and and what I was left with was having to navigate the responsibility of telling a story um, without their voice in it, and the only ironic form of justice that is represented there is traditionally it's been a story dominated by by their narrative so if anything i think what i'm proud of in the film is i think we we almost pass the microphone to a whole group of people absolutely. that don't usually absolutely. get to speak anybody who's like well you need to give equal time it's like this is equal time <laughs> like I, when i when i when i watch a television show and see 14 commercials i'm getting the other narrative <laughs> All I, the i'm time. pretty full right, on that right 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 <laughs> um how H and M takes a particular beating in this one scene, mm. where Livia Firth, this advocate for responsible clothing making and retail, et cetera, is on this panel with a representative from H and M, mm -hmm. and just starts asking the H and M rep what is fair to pay these. And she does. She's kind and very Italian, very <laughs> just um, gracious but firm. And she just keeps saying to the H and M, "That scene. Tell me about that scene. Is that, <laughs> it's like some sort of panel, or yeah, it was a. It and was the H and M a, woman doesn't have an answer. There's there's times. Yeah, there's times when you're making a film where uh, you know our big goal in telling the story was. Uh, we realized that the story didn't need to be heightened. You know, it, there is a, to your point, there's an enraging sense of injustice inherent in the story. Mm -hmm. And going into it, you know, everything from our cinematography choices to our editing choices to we didn't want to do anything to overproduce or heighten it. And there's moments when you're making a film where someone says something and your jaw just kind of hits the floor like, we, we didn't even, like, she just said that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it was such a clear yeah. illustration of a, a certain sense of corporate callous, a certain sense of illogical injustice of of so, and, and yeah it was it was a it was a conference for sustainability uh in it took place in copenhagen and we were there i was in the audience actually and um were you in the audience for that moment i was in the audience for that moment and and it was <sighs> it was wild yeah it was wild it was it was i mean i wish i could cut the whole thing into the film because the whole conversation was deeply riveting i mean these are at its base, these are fundamentally moral questions, and that makes business yes. very uncomfortable. Yes, yes, because we've just seen all of these images of people saying, "I these working conditions are killing us. We don't have enough money to feed our kids. You have people leaving their kids to be raised by other people to go to the city to work in these clothing factories yep. to make clothes for Americans, saying that we, we just need enough to... For food and water, and then you have H and M saying, "Well, we just they tell us what a fair wage is, and we pay that." And you're like, N -n "No, it's just not true." Yeah. Well, and that's I think growing up, Rob. Like I think a lot of uh, certainly a lot of people that have grown up in a, the American context will relate to this. You know, the story that we're told is that a lot of our things come from places that are far away. And they're made by very poor people, 
and those people's lives are admittedly very difficult, but they're so poor and they need the work so much that the best thing we can do is keep buying products. You know, it's like a step up. it'll step up. Like it'll it'll trickle down. It'll it you know, it's going to lead. Yes, it's yes, it's ugly now, but it's a part of this one-way ticket out of poverty. And um I think honestly at the core of the whole film, that's really what we're attacking. I think that's mythology. I think it's untrue. Uh, and I think it's more and more scientifically, hmm. economically being debunked because what we see time after time is that in, in situations of extreme poverty, um, levels of high exploitation, there's a line between empowerment and exploitation, and exploitation taking more than you're leaving. There is a sense in which it entrenches further systems of poverty. Oh, got it, got it, got it. Because the art, which I, I've, I've heard and I'm sure probably spouted off about, oh, we don't understand this person working in that factory. It's actually a step up towards yeah. autonomy. But nobody in the film... Because that's in someone's eyes. You can see it. Mm -hmm. When you, as the privileged whoever, are like, how can you do that? And they're like, oh, no, this is a step forward. Nobody in the film is saying, I make clothes for Americans, and it's a lovely step forward. They're going, yeah. no, this actually holds us down. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I think for me, like when I began to really think deeply about that in my own life, it's, um, it's a very complicated thing to be living in the world right now. Uh, as a very privileged uh, person in, yeah. in a developed country because we're more aware than we've ever been of, of what's taking place in the world and we can see it more vividly than we ever have been able to. And so you have to begin to develop a belief system that gives you rationale for why you have access to so much and so many have access to so little. And you have to develop a rationale that helps you see yourself as not connected to the effects that you don't like in the world. So when it comes to something like buying clothing, you have to work very hard Hard, actually, I think it's in a lot of our psyches to. Um, some would say the great invitation of the modern world is to look away. You know that we're we're aided all the time mm. in our ability to look away, look yeah. away from the world. And when we actually look at it and evaluate it, it's um, we're presented with 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 choices, and choices are hard because choices could change our belief system. They could change the way we've been taught to look at the world. And when I look at that belief system, I was handed very black and white. Always be suspect of belief systems that are black and white. Always be suspect of uh, a zero-sum ratio. And the first thing I criticized about that, like it's either they die in starvation and poverty or they get exploited and that leads to I, – I kind of felt like, why are those the only two – like mm -hmm. am I crazy to think there's a third way? Like couldn't we actually reinstate – a better baseline of what it means to be a human being and at the same time provide work that leads to economic yeah. growth. And I think that's a part of a whole new conversation that has for too long been excluded in this dual track of all or nothing. Right. So you end up, you spoke to the UN, UN recently? Yeah, it was since the film's come out. Yeah, we've had, it's been amazing. It's been <laughs> Wait, such a run. How old are you, by the way? 29. You're 29, you're 27, and you get the idea for this film? Mm -hmm. You follow your curiosity, you make this film about the clothing industry, and a couple years later, you're speaking at the UN. It's been incredible. It's been <laughs> incredible. Did you? <laughs> That's so good. Did you find yourself at, I assume at multiple, because you've walked on a lot of red carpets because of this film? Yeah. Like, this is unbelievable. Well, the response was crazy. And that, that's the thing you never can anticipate. Like, I think um, you follow your own curiosity and, and you go have this experience that completely changes your life. And, and, and it was that for our whole team. I mean, deeply, if, if you can picture some of the scenes that you see in the film, um, there's one scene um, where we would go to a, um, one of the garment workers that was beaten to death in that Cambodian interchange, and, and we're standing there at the funeral. And, and that guy starts talking. It's it's, yeah, it's, it's unbelievable. The guy in the white button-down starts talking. That just ripped my heart we, out. We went back. Our team went back that night to where we were staying, and uh, you know, usually at night we would talk about the day and stuff, and there were a lot of those nights, and that was one of them, where you just um, – it's just silent. You know? Yeah. It's just silent. It mm -hmm. deeply changed our life. So, okay, you have this experience. It totally changes the way you look at the world and your role in it. And then the thing you can't be prepared for is that you get to release the film and a whole bunch of people around the world say, yeah, like we, we're we ready for that idea too. Like we've started to question, you know what I mean? And that's, I mean, the process of releasing this thing has been it's been unreal because there's just been that sense of people like very, very, very famous people in the fashion industry, um, people in positions of power, people in positions of 
Um, and then a whole lot of just people like myself who are saying, wait, there is, there is this thing about our world that doesn't make sense. And, and I think it could be a lot better. I don't think it has to stay that way. And I, yeah. that's, that's amazing. Um, I remember you telling me that a Hollywood, a legendary Hollywood serious player who shall remain nameless mm -hmm. saw an early draft of the film and was like, Andrew, no one's going to watch your film about clothes. <laughs> yeah. And then like what, a year later hosts a screening of the film. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Because he, who is legendary, this gentleman, for picking the winners, yeah, saw a version, the version, yeah, and was like, no one's going to watch this. Yeah, when we were and it, and it extended back even before that, like when we were financing the film, um, which is always a very challenging process. I yeah, we had multiple people that were, can't you just go make another film about this or that or it was it was a sense of like no one they're like Andrew, no one wants to look at this. No one, no one really wants to. We we actually are going to lengths to avoid topics like this. So why is why is a global audience going to actually be comfortable enough to stop and consider? And I just said I think the world's changing, and I think it's changing faster than we yeah. know. Yeah. And I think there's going to be people that share our curiosity, and to see that unfold is is I mean truly it's yeah. To this day, the impact it's having in major companies, the impact. I mean, it's like. We are seeing things happen that I you, I just would have never dreamed of. It's very, it's it's really very humbling. Well, it's it's interesting because when I saw it, I was like, oh, I I I really wanted to interview because I know that the people who listen to the Robcast are going to see this and be like, yeah, okay, change, let's make it. Um, how do you think then for kids? You and Emily, four kids. Yeah, we have, yeah. How do you think differently, like, because with my kids, as soon as you're like, oh, good, two sweatshirts, three jeans, we're good. Oh, you all grew that. Okay. <laughs> um, how do you all, what's the discussion like in your home about clothes and where you buy them and all that now? Yeah, well, that's why I think this is really exciting, and it is a discussion. Um, we're not perfect, and we haven't figured it out yet, but it has started. What's really fascinating is I think issues like this have the ability to be doorways through which they open up lots and lots and lots of more conversations. Mm -hmm. um, we had never talked with our kids about clothing. Mm -hmm. You know, we'd never had a conversation about anything that we bought, really. I mean, it was just kind of like you go buy stuff and, and you don't really think about it. This, this has opened up a whole new conversation, and our kids are very young, and it's, um, it's profound. And I think it's exciting. It's the reason why I wanted to make the film, because I think, you see a lot of issues like this, or you see a lot of films where it's like, here's something terrible going on in the world, and, and you're powerless to do anything about it. Um, you know, it, it's difficult for the average person to, to go up against uh, the energy sector and, and fight for a, you know, it's like you see, you see Inconvenient Truth, and you're like, wow, like I feel, you know what I'm saying? It's <laughs> yeah. like daunting, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. This is one of those things that I think each one of us has control over, and I think the, the transition for me first has been a transition of going – kind of getting myself off the treadmill of buying a bunch of disposable, cheap clothes yes. that fall apart. And right. I just began to look around my wardrobe and realize, you know, I'm buying a lot of stuff that's cheap and feels good at the register. Um, and it's actually engineered to fall apart, and it fulfills that promise, and it falls apart. So even though I feel like I'm spending very little on clothing, year after year, I'm actually replenishing a wardrobe that I don't even love stylistically, and is now I'm learning, you know, coming from these places that I don't want to support. So for me, it began by reducing the amount that I'm consuming and, and being more thoughtful about it. Like yeah. buying clothes that I really love, that I'm going to wear, that I'm going to hold on to for a long time. Yes. That's kind of created room in my life, uh, both financially and thoughtfully, to begin to then ask that next set of questions of, where did this come from? And and who made this? And what's yeah. their life like? And, and, and are there brands out there that really have values that align with my own. So I would say for any, and, and then that's trickled down for our kids. And, and I would say for anyone um, that sees the film or hears the conversation, you know, the last thing I, I want anyone to walk away with is guilt. Someone, someone told me guilt is what you feel when you know you're not going to do anything about it. I want oh, feel, oh, oh. I, I'd rather people, you know, you said angry. Yeah. That's a great response because yeah. I'd rather people say, you know what? Um, my life is actually um, a part of something. My choices actually yes. do make an impact, and they're, yes. they're adding up to this thing that we go on to call yeah. history, and I get to choose. And when I – Stella McCartney has a line in the film where she says, if you don't like it, don't buy into it. And as simple as that sounds, there are so many alternatives now, 
um, and growing every day. So many companies that are dedicated to making beautiful things that respect all the hearts and hands that made those clothes along the way. And all it takes is a little bit of thought from you, a little bit more time, a little bit more research, a little bit of thoughtfulness, a couple of Google search for you yeah. to begin to transition. Yeah. And, and what I have found is this has not been one of those things that's like a downer. You know, I think we're all adverse to those things where it's like, oh, there's right, another right, right. thing I need to go care right. about. This has just been a simple way to enrich my life where some of the choices I make on a very basic level now are in congruence. They're in alignment with these things I care about on yes. a global level. Well said. Because it does, At by the end, you're completely furious, at least I, you're also like, oh, this is totally doable and changeable. Yeah. Like this is not, like you talk about oil. Yeah. Like, okay, OPEC, <laughs> like Saudi Arabia, like gas in my car, like that's just sort of exists in some other realm. But, oh, what we buy to cover our bodies. Okay, I can actually have some power over that. Well, and I would, I would say, honestly, Rob, of all the things that we looked at in the film, I would say really the most toxic thing, the most deadly thing that, that I witnessed when I look back on it all now is, uh, is that story that has been communicated to people that has, that has moved people into the role of consumers. And that's a really, really dangerous place to be mm -hmm. because when we're consumers, it, it's signifying in a manner of speech that our primary value is to be someone who takes in things. It's as if we're standing at the end of a long conveyor belt that wraps around the world and all we do is take it in. Yeah. It removes you from the truer picture that you make choices, that you make trade-offs and exchanges, you make purchases, you make that your life is full of these impacts and those impacts are felt by very real people and very real places all over the world. And you want to talk about disrupting the status quo. You don't want to talk about true progress. It, it's going to come about when more of us begin to look at our lives and say, you know what? I'm a, I'm a human being. I'm a citizen. I'm a person. I'm not a consumer. I, I actually, I'm a part of this thing that's unfolding. I'm not a bystander on the sidelines watching this thing unfold. I get to, for this moment in time, be a part of what we say we value. I get to, mm -hmm. I get to contribute with something as small as a t-shirt. That's, that's really powerful to me. Absolutely. A yeah, what do I even to add to that? It's so good. So true. And when did you come up with the name, when did True Cost, was that the working title the whole time? It was. My, my producer, uh, Michael, Michael, who's just extraordinary, uh, yes. came up with it uh, very early on. We were, we, were, we were studying, we were reading an economics book that first week, and they were, they were talking about capitalism, and I had never read an economics book in my life, which is also horrifying that I could be in my mid-20s <laughs> and have never had to. But they were talking about how the idea that we, we live in a system that uh, doesn't count the true cost, that we, we've, we count profit. and when the you, cost of the shirt. But not the true cost of the shirt. Which yeah, is a different number. That's a whole different. There's a human cost. Yeah. There's an environmental cost, and and those aren't factored in our equation right now. And hopefully, what we're dreaming of, and what I mean, what we need to like outsource and crowdsource creative thinking on, is I think one of the things that um, that this film has spoken to, along with a lot of other work in, in the world right now, is, is this idea that, that maybe we need a, a, a new system. Maybe in 2016, we need a more humane, just, accurate way of accounting for the toll that we're taking on the world. And so if you're a business and you're making profit, um, maybe I'm dreaming that in the future we're going to live in a world where uh, if you make that profit at the expense of other people and cross a line on human dignity, or if you make it in a way that degradates or, or takes away from this this planet that's going to sustain all of our lives um that that yeah there's a true cost there's a there's a gap there's a gap in our thinking there's a gap in our we're not even we're not even counting that right now <sighs> so good now there are some practical things that are happening from people who have seen the movie and wanted to help hmm. that you had told me about yeah, um, there's a there's a lot of things that are taking place right now. Um, some some are on a very global governance scale, mm -hmm. and and we're trying to facilitate uh, some massive things in regards to policy, uh, trade agreements, regulation, import export. Um, We've got a website, truecostmovie.com, where we're kind of keeping people posted on, on ways they can support some of that. That stuff's – it's heavy lifting. It's slow. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But we're trying to get more uh, of that stuff in place. Um, and there's also just there's, – there's more and more people that are – 
just bringing to the table unbelievably creative solutions. I mean, there's there's entrepreneurs that are starting businesses. There's people um, that are doing clothing swaps where they get together in cities. Like we just had one in Los Angeles where everybody comes and brings clothes and they they swap them and they you know it's like just just really. I Did think, you organize that? No, we didn't. No, there's been there's been all sorts of and there's it's it's there's there's fashion schools all over the world that are that are not only screening the film but they're doing all these things. There, it's. It's it's just kind of incredible. We're trying to keep up with <laughs> a lot of what's taking place now. I love it. Okay, one last thing. There's a scene in the film where you we've met all these people around the world who make clothing and the conditions are just gut wrenching. And then you have this security camera footage of stores in America on Black Friday where the door comes up early, early in the morning on Black Friday and the crowd rushes in and people are screaming and grabbing stuff. Mm. And you just... I'm giving away the end of the movie, but I don't care. <laughs> You're, you just juxtapose Black Friday and people pushing and shoving to get at piles of Uggs. <laughs> Um, I, I did that scene evolve over the course of the, sh the footage you were shooting. How did you get that sh footage, the security footage? Um, uh, my producer actually found that clip and showed it to me, and I thought uh, he showed it to me very early on. Actually, we were in production. And he showed it to me on a on an airplane, and it um, yeah, it really it was really upsetting. Yeah, uh, what's interesting about that sequence is we um. We had we had cut we we had cut a, a, a working cut of the film because our, our team is very small. Um, we were cutting the film as we went, so we would cut on airplanes and on you know. You would shoot in Bangladesh, and then the right plane ride home, you'd edit. Yeah, where you'd shot. yeah, and then even and even at night. That's so guerrilla, I love it. And, <laughs> and even at night in those countries, we would edit with our fixer translators because they would be giving us the information for subtitling and stuff. So um, we had filmed a lot of the film. We had a, a working cut. And the ending didn't have that sequence you're describing. Um, we went back, and one of uh, the last things we filmed was that scene where Shima, who's a, um, a mother garment worker in the film, and she's she's going to to take her daughter um, back to the village to where she's gonna yeah. they're they're gonna be separated. Um, the single most heart wrenching thing I've ever been a part of um, to to this day, the thing that. Uh, just just kind of tears me apart. And um, we came back from that trip. We looked back at the working cut that we'd had. And um, we just said, it's got to be, we got to turn it up. Like we got to, we got to express where the audience is going to get to that point And they're going to be, they're going to be angry. And we need to just kind of go for it. You know, I think a lot of times filmmaking is about restraint and it's about not overstepping where the audience is. You're, you're kind of trying to build a case and you're trying to stay out of the way so that the audience goes along and gets the different points in the journey that you feel are important and then they, they arrive at yeah. their conclusion. Yeah. And we said, let's just, let's just, let's give it everything we've got. And we cut that sequence in, in just a few minutes and we just step back and I, 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 it, it, it just made me weep. It made me cry. Yeah. That's how, that's the effect. It's one of those classic examples where you can say it a thousand times, mm. but then you just juxtaposing these two images and just goes back and forth, back, I don't know, like two or three times. It just, I was, yeah, it was just mm. devastating, devastating. Mm. I don't know how you inter end an interview with the word devastating, <laughs> but I hope by now people are like, I have to go see this movie. Please, friends, go see this movie. TrueCostMovie.com is the website. Yeah. And you're making more films. You I got am. all kinds of ideas. Ladies and gentlemen, Andrew Morgan, the movie is True Cost. Thank you so much for coming by. Thanks, I just It was just you inspiring me to no end, and I'm so glad everybody can see the movie. Thanks for having me. It means a lot. Grace and peace, everyone.